Thanks. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Lester Elim's Bible Study. Uh, we're doing a series on faith. I just want to ask God's blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your good gifts to us. We thank you for the many blessings. We thank you for the blessing of salvation. We thank you for the blessing of your word. And we ask, O oh God, as we turn to your word, and as we study faith, we pray, Lord, that our faith will grow. Lord, that you'll grant to us great faith, mountain-moving faith, faith that will help us endure till the end. So we ask, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will just bless these series of studies for everyone who listens to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we said last week, faith is essential to every area of the Christian life. And in our first study, we looked at some basic fundamentals, looked at the importance of faith, because obviously it says that it is impossible to please God without faith. We looked at the object of our faith, which is the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We looked at a definition of faith. We looked at the origin of our faith from Hebrews, where it says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And we looked at faith as a body of belief. Uh, Christians down through the centuries have had statements of faith which has helped the church uh, defend against error because obviously we're warned in the Bible that false teachers would come and in order to discern a false teacher from a true teacher then we need to know the word of God and what we believe. This evening I want to consider, I suppose, the, the basic foundation stone, and that's saving faith. Saving faith. That is the foundation stone. It's the entrance into the Christian life. And I've got a number of headings. I've got definition. I've got paradox, which means basically something that seems contradictory, but yet is true. Saving faith, I'm going to tell you, is an act of God and not an act of man. We're going to speak about counterfeits. There is an element of faith uh, that is not true faith or genuine saving faith. And we're also going to look at the opposite, marks of true saving faith. So firstly, we're going to look at a definition. We're going to be looking at some verses from Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. going to be reading, first of all, just verse 8 and 9. Well-known verse. It says, For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. And someone said, I'm commentating on this verse, said, faith is the door to salvation. And here in this verse we read the truth of that statement, that salvation is by grace and it's received through faith. There's no merit uh, or works of man are involved in our salvation, as the next verse goes on to say, it's not of works, so that no man can boast. 
And this verse also tells us, or these two verses also tells us, that this faith, this safe in faith, is not of ourselves, but is a gift of God. The originator, the author, or the source of our faith, as we saw last week, is the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And saving faith is a gift of God. But in order to comprehend the wonder of salvation, I want us to read the context of these two verses. So we're going to read Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1 down to the two verses that we read. And I want to stop as we go through at various points as we read to see what it's saying. So we're going to read firstly Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 3. And it says, And you, as he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And these three verses, I suppose, describe our condition when we are born, because we have all inherited a sinful nature from our forefather Adam. And our condition prior to salvation is that we are dead in trespasses and sins. And like a corpse, we're unable to do any spiritual good. A dead person cannot do anything. And so the illustration is that we were dead in sin. We could not save or rescue ourselves. We were subject to the ruler of this world, the enemy of our souls, Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him. It says we walked, in verse 2, in times past we walked according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air. We didn't perhaps realize or recognize it, but we were in Satan's kingdom and under his dominion. And like people in the world, we followed after our own desires and lusts. That's what verse 3 says, that in times past we walked in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. So we lived our lives in accordance with our own desires and sinful lusts. That's how we live. We had little thought for God. We lived for ourselves. We were driven, if you like, by selfish ambition, by our pride, by whatever took our fancy. And that is the state of man before he becomes a Christian. Paul goes on in verse 4 and says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. As you know, we were created in the image and likeness of God. And God looks down and sees our plight. And in his mercy and in his love, he planned salvation. He planned salvation. Mercy means he does not give us what we deserve. And grace can mean he gives us what we do not deserve. But it was God's love and his mercy when he saw the state of sinful man 
to act. And in verse 5 we see what he did even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved. And Jesus in the physical raised three people from the dead. He would raise the widow's son, he raised Jairus' daughter, and he raised Lazarus. And as in the natural, so in the spiritual, as pastor is often teaching us, he quickens. He quickens. He quickens, as it says, that he quickened us in verse 5, that though we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. And those who were once spiritually dead, he makes spiritually alive. And not only that, it says in verse 6, that he's exalted us, and he hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have been, once we've been saved, we have been united in Christ. And we have been raised. Our position has changed. Prior to conversion, we are under the dominion of Satan. After conversion, we've been lifted into the heavens, seated with Christ. And the spiritual forces are underneath us. Verse 7 that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Down here on earth, the glorification of believers and of saints is hidden. But in the age to come, everyone will know those who belong to Christ. And then we come to these two verses. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is by God's grace. He initiates it. He initiates it. He is the author of our faith. And it's him that grants us that saving faith to believe. And there's no works of man involved. It is a free gift. It's not of works so that no man can boast that his salvation is through something that he has done. So based on that, what is a definition of saving faith? Well, the one that I've come up with <laughs> is saving faith is the means by which God's grace through and in Christ makes us spiritually alive and through him all the blessings of salvation are received. Saving faith is the means by which God's grace through and in Christ makes us spiritually alive and through him, all the blessings of salvation are ours, is received. The blessings of salvation are many. We turn to Romans chapter 8. Again, some familiar verses. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to be reading from verse 28 down to verse 31, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, verse 31. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and who he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, 
Who can be against us? The blessings of salvation. This text is sometimes called the chain of salvation. The chain of salvation. Because of God's foreknowledge, He knows everything. God is all-knowing. According to his foreknowledge, he predestined that believers would be what? Conformed to the image of his Son. We would be made like Christ. That is God's ultimate purpose, that we would be like Christ. So we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those are called, they hear the gospel and respond to the gospel, they are justified, they are right before God, and eventually we will be glorified. We will get our new bodies and we will live with Christ for all eternity. The blessings of salvation and of saving faith. The second point is, there's a little bit of a paradox if I were to ask you, is it easy or hard to obtain saving faith? Is it easy or is it hard to obtain saving faith? Just going to look at some verses that are well known. First, some that would suggest it's easy. Romans chapter 10. Going to read verse 9 down to 13. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Or Acts 16. Acts 16. Verse 29, this is about the Philippian jailer. Acts 16, verse 29 to 31, it says, Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Easy as A, B, C. Accept that you're a sinner and need salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with your mouth that decision that you have made. These verses would seem to suggest that salvation is easy. We're now going to turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 22 to 24. And he says, And he went through the cities and villages, this is Jesus, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that will be saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter and shall not be able. Or Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Just going to read verses 23 
to 25. And it follows on from the story where a young man has come to Jesus and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, basically, keep the commandments. And the man says, I've done that. What else do I lack? And he says, give all that you have to the poor and come and follow me. And when the young man heard that, he was very sorrowful, for he was a wealthy young man. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. There's reading on Luke the word, the word that is used for strive is the Greek word, and I'll probably do massacre the pronunciation, <laughs> agonizer mania. And it's from what we get our word, agonize, or agony. And it means to strive, as it says, as in a contest, for a prize where you're straining every nerve to obtain the goal, object, or prize. Just for the benefit of uh, Sharon and uh, Richard, we just, I asked a question whether it was easy or hard to obtain saving faith. Whether it is easy or hard. We looked, just before you come in, at some of the easy verses, for example, like Romans, uh, where it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that God raised him from the dead, and confess that with your mouth. And we said it could be as simple as ABC, except that you are a sinner, believe in the Lord, and confess with your mouth. But then we've just looked at a verse in Luke, where it says to strive to enter into the narrow gate. And it speaks really about few will find it. Or here in Matthew, where this rich young man uh, came to Jesus and had this conversation and went away sad because he had many much possessions. And Jesus says it's hard for those with riches to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So is it easy or is it hard? A paradox. Well, I would say there is a simplicity in the gospel in coming to Christ. The difficulty or the obstacles are all on our side. Because saving faith requires, first of all, humility. Humility and not pride. Humility and not pride. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot earn our salvation. But we live in a world that rewards merit, basically. Work hard and you'll get a good, and study hard and you'll get a good job with a good pay. It rewards merit. If you work hard, you'll do well. If you're lazy, then you won't. And so humility is not something that comes to us naturally. Many people have a problem with pride. They say, I'm a self-made man or woman in business because they've built up a business themselves. And it boasts up pride and self-image. So one of the difficulties in coming to Christ is not on God's side, it's on our side because it requires humility. Because it requires humility. We cannot contribute to it. It's a gift from God. Secondly, there's no other way to the world that is a, an anathema. They believe all roads lead to God. But the Bible says that there is only one way to God. 
there is only one mediator between God and man. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you cannot come to the Father except through me. And all religions are not the same. They don't lead to God, not to the true God. But all religions, in some sense, are exclusive. In fact, all belief systems are exclusive, because if you believe one thing, that means you don't believe if I was a Muslim, then I wouldn't agree with Christianity. Or if I was an Hindu, then I wouldn't believe the same things about Christ that Christianity does. And if I was an atheist, then I wouldn't believe in God at all. So it, 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 all belief systems are to some extent exclusive. They've got to be. Because if you believe one thing, it means you don't agree with something else. And Christianity says there is only one way to heaven. And that is through the cross. We've got to go to the cross for our salvation. So that's another stumbling block. A third stumbling block is when people understand the true cost of becoming a Christian. That we have to forsake everything else. Luke 14. In Luke 14 we get some words of Jesus regarding discipleship and following him. Luke 14, verse 25 to 27. And they were great, went, and they went great multitudes with him, with him, that's with Christ, they were following him, and he turned and he said unto them, If any man come to me, and ate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. One of the sayings I used to tell at the church where I used to be, it costs you nothing to become a Christian but it would cost you everything being a Christian. Because God could demand your life. And when people realise the true price, they're not, some are not prepared to pay it and turn back. When the difficulties come, they turn back. So is saving faith easy or hard? As I said, there is a simplicity in the Gospel in that you come to Christ and you come to the cross. But the difficulty is our pride gets in our way. We think we can get there some other way and we're not always, are we prepared to pay the cost? Thirdly, I want to say that salvation and saving faith is an act of God and not of man. Salvation and saving faith is an act of God and not of man. John chapter 3, you probably know the story of Nicodemus coming to Christ by night. And what does Jesus say to him, he says in John 3 and verse 5, that except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And we have the expression, don't we, that we must be born again. We must be born again. And it comes, obviously, from this encounter between Jesus and and Nicodemus. We must be born again. We must be born of the Spirit. And I say, pastor says, as in the natural, so in the spiritual. I didn't really have much say in my birth. <laughs> in fact, I didn't have any. I just arrived. <laughs> it was an act 
between my parents. That's how we all come. Through our parents. And spiritually, we need, we're born by an act of our Heavenly Father. In the Old Testament, we read about a new covenant that God would enter into with his people. And we know that that new covenant was inaugurated by Christ at, when he taught the disciples about the Lord's table. He said that this is a new covenant purchased by his blood. But I want to look at these a couple of Old Testament references about the New Covenant first and see what they say and then we're looking at a verse in the New. The first verses are Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm going to read verses 25 to 27. Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. This is God speaking. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statues, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And if you want to keep your finger in there and turn back to the book before it, the prophet Jeremiah, it's the book just before Ezekiel, chapter 31. Chapter 31, reading verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no man every more his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And the point I want to bring out from this, both of these readings, is that they're full of the personal pronoun I. It's all about what God does. It's all about what God does. He says, I will make a new covenant. He says, I will forgive their iniquities. He says, I will remember their sins no more. I will take away our old stony heart, our heart of sin. And I will give you a new heart, a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I will put my law within you and you will walk in my statutes. It's all about God. That's why I say salvation is an act of God and not of man. It's all what God does in a person's life. Turn to John's Gospel, chapter 1. John chapter 1, going to be reading verses 11 to 13. 
He came unto his own, and his own received him not. This is Jesus. But as many as received him, to them he gave, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And it's that verse 13 in particular which I think brings out this fact that it's something that God does. A person does not become a child of God by being born, by human lineage. I think some says by natural descent. We're not born Christians. It's not of blood. It's not that we're born Christians. We're born sinners. It's not of the will of the flesh. You don't become a Christian through man's traditions. They didn't become Christians through circumcision. You don't become a Christian by being christened. You don't become a Christian even by being baptised in water. That's just an outward sign of something that's happened inside. None of those things make you a Christian. You can't become a Christian by the traditions of men. Then it says, nor of the will of man. A human decision. But it's by God's act alone. Salvation is something, a supernatural act that God does in the life of a believer. Now you might want to debate this point a bit later. I'm not a fan of the sinner's prayer. My counsel would be to use it cautiously. You see, because I think if the sinner's prayer is used without wisdom and understanding, it makes salvation man's decision. I say that if it's not used wisely, it makes salvation man's decision. And some think of the supernatural act of God in salvation is lost. Because you say, pray this prayer and you'll be saved. But what has to happen, I, I, my illustration would be this. It's like a 999 call. If I'm in trouble, in, at sea, or there's a fire and I can't escape my house, I will phone 999. But unless the rescue service get to me and actually pluck me out of the water or pluck me out of the house, I'm going to die. And the sinner's prayer to me is a 999 call. And that God will come and ask to do something supernatural in the person's life. The sinner's prayer actually is quite a recent thing in Christianity. Most of the old Puritans and the old reformers and the old uh, people who went around evangelizing didn't use it. It first came to prominence in the 19th century by a man by the name of Charles Finney who used it during is American revivals. Some of Finney's converts were saved. Some, sadly, did not last. And I think if it's not used correctly, it can lead to perhaps badly birthed Christians or people being worse, being deceived, that they are, in fact, believers when they're not. And so I would use it sparingly. Because salvation is something that God does. And I just see the sinner's prayer as a 999 call. And God will then come and do a work if it's genuine in that person's life. Let you think about that one. I would point them to the cross. I would point them to say, use your own words. Confess your sins. You know what sins you have done better than I do. You confess your sins to Christ at the cross. And Christ will respond and do that new thing in their life.
Salvation is a supernatural act of God. It's a miracle. It's the greatest miracle. So building on from that, I want to speak about counterfeits of saving faith. Counterfeits of saving faith. You see, the enemy of our souls wants to keep people in bondage. And he will try and self-delude people into thinking that they're saved when they're not saved. Because if he can do that, then he's won three quarters of the battle. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 speaks of a godly and a worldly sorrow. They're not the same thing, and it's easy to get them confused. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10 says this, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of this world works death. There is a godly sorrow and there is a worldly sorrow. A godly sorrow brings repentance to salvation, whereas a worldly sorrow brings death. It's not true repentance. And as an example, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read verses 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. It says, Lest there be any fornicator, or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. It says he could find no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau's repentance was over selling his birthright. I believe it was genuine and heartfelt. He was truly sorry that he had given up his birthright for a bowl of porridge. He came to realise it far too late. Yet why could he find no place of repentance? You see, I think this is worldly sorrow. Because I think worldly sorrow, what it is, it's sorrow over one sin. It's often sorrow over one sin sin. And Jesus came to save us from our sins, plural. True repentance involves sorrow over all our sins. And worldly sorrow, the difference is, it's sorrow or regret over a particular sin or failing. It could even be sorrow just because you've been caught out. Some people are sorry because they've been caught out doing wrong and they have to face the punishment. They're not truly sorry. It's a worldly sorrow. They're sorry because they've been found out and have to face the consequences. And as I said, some people, they are truly sorrowful over something perhaps that they've done. Perhaps some big sin in their life. And they think they've come to repentance and salvation. But the problem is there's other sins in their life that they've never repented of. True repentance involves sorrow over all our sins. We're all sinners, and we all sin in many different ways. And I am guilty of more than one sin. I won't tell you... I won't tell you some of the sins that I've done. But if you look at the if you look at the Ten Commandments, ever looked a woman lustfully, then you've committed adultery. Ever told a lie, then you're a liar. Ever stolen, 
or rob your employee of work of time that should be for them or perhaps put something on your expenses that shouldn't really be on your expenses or whatever it is ever avoided that by paying cash and the list goes on ever covetedness covetedness can make you break every sin the other night because you can put something before God and if it's a person of the opposite sex, you could commit adultery. You could be like the King David and actually commit murder. I mean, David's sin was more than one sin. And in order to be saved, you have to repent of all your sins. And worldly sorrow, and sometimes what happens with people, is they're only sorry for one sin. Because they've been caught out, or because genuinely, they are truly sorry for that sin but not for their others. That's the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Acts chapter 9 is another example. Acts chapter 9, sorry, Acts chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 9. Acts chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 9. But there is a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when, they were, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he was not fallen upon none of them, only they that were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray to God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven you. For I perceive that thou art in the goal of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you spoke of come upon me. Simon, we read in verse 13, believed, and he was baptized. But later we read in verse 21 that his heart was not right before God. Was he saved? It would appear to me that Simon's heart issue, our issue was a desire to be somebody. Might call it pride or status. He wanted status and position. Why do I say that? Because he used to be recognized as somebody great. He had deceived the people. And he was giving out that he was some great one, it says in the King James in verse 9. He was giving out that he himself was some great one. That all changed when Philip came. And he lost his position to some extent. 
And then when he saw the apostles come, lay hands on people, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, then we see the condition of his heart. He wanted, to, he wanted that power for himself. He had a heart issue, I believe. Was he saved? Was his repentance genuine? We read in John's Gospel, John chapter 6. I'm not going to look at it because time is running out. But we read in John 6, 66, these words, From that time, many of these disciples went back and walked no more with him. You see, if you read through that chapter, Jesus had just fed the 5,000, and he was teaching, and he was saying, you've got to eat of my bread, and drink, uh, eat of my flesh, and drink of my blood. And then this put people off. And it says... It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And the thing is, you see, in many gospel services and appeals, emotions can run quite high. And people respond for different reasons. Some might respond because they want to belong to the family. They want to be a part of something. They want to belong. Perhaps their life has been a lonely life. Perhaps because of um, mental health issues that, you know, they've found acceptance. People don't accept them. Or they've been hurt in the past. Or perhaps they believe that they become a Christian all their problems will go away. The parable of the sower. You know the parable of the sower. There's four kinds of soil, isn't there? There's only one good soil. There's only one good soil. There's three bad soils. And sometimes, friends, we need wisdom and discernment to discern true and false serving faith. And we need to examine our own hearts. And my last section is, what are then the marks of true saving faith? We've looked at counterfeits, perhaps people only repenting over one sin, perhaps people's uh, desire in Simon's case was to be a somebody. Perhaps people get offended by the teaching that they did in John chapter 6. But the marks of true saving faith, John the Baptist said this, in Matthew 3, verse 8, bring, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. You see, if a person is truly saved and turned away from their sins and brought into a relationship with God that's been restored, then we should see some evidence of that fact. They need to be, and we need to look in our own hearts for evidence of true repentance. John 13, what are some of these evidences? John 13, and verse 35, says this, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, you have, if you have love one for another. And I would suggest the first mark, if you like, because God is love, that we would have a love for one another and for our brethren. One John chapter two. First Epistle of John, chapter 2. Verse 3 to 5. Says this, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. And Jesus is said, said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the second mark of true grace is a desire to live a pure lifestyle, a holy lifestyle. God is holy. And without holiness, it is impossible to see him. And not that we don't ever sin when we become a Christian, but our desire is to be like Jesus and to walk in holiness. And we will obviously sometimes fail. But the thing is, when we fail, do we seek to put it right and be reconciled in our relationship? Does it upset us? Do we have a desire to live a godly life? I've seen many people who have said they're Christians and believe them to be Christians, believe their testimony. But I've seen a number fall away because they've not lived a pure life. Their relationships have not been pure. They've got involved perhaps with an unsaved person. Young and old. And when they've been challenged, then they've not repented, but they've made excuses. The mark of a true Christian who's been saved is that they want to please God and walk in accordance with his will. One John, same chapter, first epistle of John, chapter one. We read in verse six and seven, don't we? If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our regular pattern of conduct, our walk, should show the truth of our confession and help give us assurance. You see, it's really hypocrisy to claim that we walk with God and live in unrepentant sin. That's what it says. There's many other scriptures. We're saved to serve, aren't we? Ephesians 2 verse 10 speaks about God having prepared good works for those who belong to him. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. As believers, we serve to serve our God. These are all marks of save, true saving faith. And my last reading is from Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Beginning to read at verse 1 down to verse 10. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. 
And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. But if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. But if you do these things, you shall never fall. Our faith is precious. Saving faith is precious. And God has given us all things it says all things that pertain to life and godliness. And he calls us to diligently seek adding these virtues to our life. And if we do that, it says we will be fruitful and sure of our salvation. Because that's the greatest thing, to know that you are saved. Assurance, to know that you are are saved. As we saw last week, John wrote his gospel and its epistle that you might know that you know Jesus Christ and have eternal life. Thank you for listening. don't know if anyone's got any questions, but as last week, you can ask a question as long as I know the answer.